While I do that, I'm going to have my beautiful wife share. <laughs> good morning again, brothers, sisters, and friends. It is so good again to see you. Like, yes, last Sunday, this Sunday, last weekend, happy 30th anniversary Amen. again. I mean, wasn't it an incredible time? Um, it was so great to have the whole family here. Jeremy and Gabrielle had to go back to work, but their navel string is tied. Uh, they are turning to the bone, and it was, I just want to share with you, so funny, back in Miami and everywhere, people, some of the people would ask, why did Jeremy get to be so tall? You know, where did this come from? You know, it really was, like, remarkable seeing him just in middle school just get taller and taller. But the most amazing thing is coming back here and seeing him with Abu and uh, the Richard brothers and Michael and seeing that he is not the tallest person here. <laughs> and so there is something in the water because I see that Janino has it, Devonte. I mean, there is something about young men walking tall in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's a beautiful thing. I just want to lift up everybody who worked so hard behind the scenes. I know and there was so much work to make the 30th an incredible time, and that's just so encouraging to us. I know that Nicole and uh, Nadine and um, I saw uh, Candy, all the people at registration, all the ushers, the people behind the scenes, the concert was great. Amen. Um, I, I just want to lift up all the stitches that created a hymn. Mm -hmm. And now the hymn is dancing. We have more stitches. That was just a beautiful thing. Um, I, I just also want to just lift up um, just the disciples here. I, I mean, seeing faithful faces for over 15 years is so amazing. Now marriages and, and children. And I mean, to leave from four and meet your 18-year-old children and 22 is just an amazing thing. I want to lift up the shepherds who lift up um, uh, Nanino and uh, Merlene's hands, the shepherds, every Bible talk leader, every person who disciples somebody, everybody who encourages somebody. It's just really uh, the admin, just everybody just that have just poured in to make the 30th and each week uh, great. You guys know how to celebrate. I mean, yeah. I mean, Merlene is definitely, you know, the superwoman with the S on her chest. Uh, I mean, uh, to see that she was the 10th person uh, converted here. And Merlene, to, to see you uh, celebrate 50 years of life on this 30th anniversary, several weeks. Uh, loyal, lovely leader. I uh, just really uh, commend you, sister. So proud of you. Uh, keep lifting up her arms. What a beautiful thing to have people born, raised, studying the Bible, oh, yeah. right here as a teen and a single woman, right. be leaders of the church here in Trinidad and Tobago. Amen. That is a very yeah. precious thing. You can ask anywhere in any parts of the world to have people who actually study the Bible, have been faithful, and who are now leading and serving the people, willing princes. You know, we need to praise the Lord. For you, Nanino and Merlene, we love you so much. And also celebrating 15 years. It's been 15 years since we left. And now we, it was like a marked time because we were a part of their wedding. They had 15 years anniversary July 3rd. So go figure. I mean, where does time go? Right. All right. I will accept mommy. Yeah. But I am not going to accept grandma, okay? <laughs> I embraced it. You challenged me. Okay, we went from big sister to mom, but grandma, I know that this wisdom around his mouth makes him distinguished. That is wisdom. Not, we are not looking to be grandparents anytime soon. All right, please continue to remember that. Um, and uh, just, I just lastly just want to share just how, um, just to bring you some greetings from New York City. Uh, the Queens region. It is, uh, we just celebrated um, having our mission Sunday, and our goal was to have over a million dollars uh, for the last several years. And we did raise over a million dollars in special missions uh, in New York and Queens region. Amen. Praise God. And uh, for the Queens region, our goal was 107,000. And 
We made our goal now. You know, we made it. We didn't make it the day. And we were like, okay, amen, God. But this year, we made it the week yeah. of special. We Come made on. it last year, but yeah, the, week the week we made it. Right. They have all kind of giving online and everything like that. And that goes to support some of the work in the Caribbean, Africa, upstate New York, the Strength and Weakness Ministry. It also uh, supports some of the um, ministry training programs and other things in New York. So I just want to encourage you. Uh, with that and uh, it was so great to have Sam and Cynthia Powell for the church to send them here and you guys were incredible hosts to them uh, they were so impressed and so encouraged by the church in the 30th anniversary and lastly I just want to share with you about CSI which is our Caribbean CSI Queens which is our campus student initiative right um, we just, during the summer, have people go out, not only campus, if there's teachers, people who are available, everybody just goes on the campus, whoever can, for whatever time. We go, we share for about a half an hour, and then what we do is just have an informal Bible study for about 20 to 30 minutes. And the, uh, last year, the year before, we had uh, several people um, met and studied and became disciples. Two of those girls uh, are actually interning this year. Um, in our ministry training program, volunteers, and it's so amazing. And I just want to share about one girl named Shana. She was met after CSI, but she just turned a year. She's so quiet. Talk about the power of one. She's very quiet, but you know she's giving. But she actually met uh, a girl named Irene, who's actually Greek, and she's in Cyprus right now. So, I mean, and she helps us with all the ways that we butcher the names in the Bible that are Greek and all the places. But um, it's, she's an amazing disciple. She's actually visiting her family in Greece right now and coming back to New York. She also in, um, had an opportunity, this quiet girl with the spirit of God in her presence, invited her, inv her advisor. And her advisor was giving her drop home and she saw a Bible she didn't know it was a Bible because she's a millennial and it was in a Bible case. And, you know, most of their Bibles, she didn't know what it was. She just moved the books and everything. And she said, oh, wait a minute, you're moving that book. Uh, oh, wait a minute, that's my Bible. I'm trying to read it. I don't know it that well. So Shana goes, ding, 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 ding. Oh, you're trying to read the Bible? I've been doing that too. Listen, I want to invite you to come out to our midweek service. She came out to the midweek service and one of the, uh, the girls was getting baptized. And her name, she's a wonderful woman. Her name is Francesca. Francesca, from that day, continued to come, study the Bible, became a disciple, helped her aunt. Her aunt became a disciple. That was in December and February of this past year, and it was just really encouraging. Just one sharing another one with the power of God, because we have something very precious. Through all our ups, sometimes we're down, but we know that God is faithful. Right. and that uh, Jesus is Lord. That's Thank right. you so much. I love you. More hugs and kisses to see you after the fellowship. Amen. Amen. Well, now that my dentures are in place, let's say a prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time uh, together. We're thankful for the way your spirit worked and has been working and continues to work in people's hearts. And Father, I pray that um, as I preach your word today, that you would fill me up with your Holy Spirit, help me to preach your word boldly as it ought to be preached, and I pray, Father, that you would help me to remain uh, faithful to what is written. I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of all who are here, that we may increase in our knowledge of Jesus, and we may deepen our convictions of who we worship as Messiah. And that those who are seeking, who are searching, will find a more clear vision of Jesus and will have increased confidence that he is who he declares himself to be. And that we may uh, all uh, attach ourselves intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally to him so that we may be with him and the final day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So my message today is we proclaim him. And the main text that we're going to take a look at is in Colossians uh, chapter 1. And uh, I want to ditto everything my beautiful wife said 
about the 30th anniversary. It was very, very special. And um, it was, it, I, I, I really, seriously, I really honestly felt like a proud dad, I have to say, um, as I saw just the church, just you guys, and just how you've grown and matured and um, been strengthened in your faith. Um, so, so proud of Nanino and Merlene and the work that, that they're doing. And just to see all the disciples from uh, North, Shaguana, South, Tobago, um, I want to commend you to, to keep um, your feet grounded and keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 So I also want to lift up, you guys have an amazing AV team. Now, I've been in different places. Rob and I are from New York. We've been in New York now since 2012. But let me tell you, this, all this AV stuff, the wires, the, the, the PowerPoint, the video, all that stuff is, is not easy to do week in, week out. And I just want to lift up all the AV brothers and sisters. Awesome job. Awesome job. Colossians chapter 1 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything we might, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I think we have those scriptures up there. Awesome job, AV team. Uh, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Paul, in this passage, was talking to the Colossian church, and he was, he was looking at these attributes of Jesus, that he is, he is the image of the invisible God, that he's not just a mere man, but he is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. And in verse 28, he says, we proclaim him. Who's the we? We, the church. The church has a mission. Now, proclaiming Christ is not the only thing the church does, but it is the most important thing we do as a church. Can I get an amen? amen. We proclaim Christ. That is the mission of the church. We have a message to the lost world to proclaim a risen Messiah. This responsibility, it has not been given to a government or to a company. It has been given to the church. It is our sacred duty to proclaim Jesus. We live in an age where we have unprecedented access to spiritual knowledge. There are websites, there's radio, there's a television. And then if you search hard enough, you, everyone can develop their own YouTube channel. And there's a lot of knowledge about Jesus that you have access to. And everyone has, you can easily read the scriptures and find some piece of truth about Jesus. But sometimes you may look at a piece of Jesus and miss the whole Christ. Sometimes you may find that the true message is actually being distorted. That what is being proclaimed in, on YouTube or on the radio or on TV is not completely what is in the scriptures. I'm here to tell you that we learned first about Jesus through the apostles. The, and all the teachings of the apostles are found in one place and one place only, the New Testament. In this body of work, we have eyewitness evidence 
written down by the men who saw him and who touched him and who witnessed some incredible things during the life of Jesus. And so my appeal to you is if we are going to know and learn more about Jesus, we must go back to the teachings of the apostles. We must dive in to the teachings of the New Testament. It's time we turn off the YouTube channel, turn off the radio, turn off the internet, and open our Bibles. Amen? We have a, a treasure, an eternal treasure, right in the palm of our hand. And so today, we must ask ourselves what, was, what Christ was proclaimed in the first century. What Christ was proclaimed in the first century? And what Christ do we proclaim now? And if, if you've been listening to these different sources, you'd realize that there's a difference between the Christ that is being proclaimed today and the Christ that was proclaimed by the first century church, beginning with the apostles. And today what I want to do is I want to look at three critical aspects of Jesus that was proclaimed in the first century. And my encourage some of these things might challenge you. And, and you may not agree with everything I'm saying. And I, I accept that. I accept that you may not agree with some of the things that I say. Well, I want you to hold your passing of judgment of whatever I say and go back home and read the Bible. Read the scriptures. They're going to be right up here. I want to, I want to encourage you to write them down. And I want you to go home privately. Because you're going to hear a lot of people agree with me. They're going to be fired up. And I don't want you to be swayed by people's opinion. I want you to, to write these scriptures down and you go home and you wrestle with these things yourself. And you ask yourself, did I hear the truth this morning? That's what you got to ask yourself. Did I Hear the truth this morning. Point number one, we proclaim the risen Christ. We proclaim the risen Christ. Luke 24, great passage in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus met um, his disciples. And it says in verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of bread broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. In verse 44, he, it says, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are my witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on, from on high. We proclaim the risen Christ. Prior to this passage, Jesus was crucified and was hung on a cross and the and the apostles saw him die they buried him in, they buried him in a tomb and three days later something incredible happened he rose from the dead and it's, it's interesting that even though he told them that he, this was going to happen they didn't believe it 
And then in this passage, he, he, he comes before them, and it's not a ghost. Jesus didn't appear as some mirage, some kind of 3D thing, some kind of hologram, right? This, this was not a, some extraterrestrial light, um, what you call it, magic light. Jesus said, here, you, you want proof? Touch, touch me. He said, he said, look at my hands and feet. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones. And as he is showing them, they, they, they must have seen and touched flesh. And they must have been able to look through his wrists and see the bones. Now, I don't know about you, but that, even reading it, is a mind-blowing experience. This is mind-blowing. You don't just make a story like this up. Now, I remember when I was a young boy in, 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 in high school, they, 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 they gathered all the, the students together one, one day in the auditorium. And we're like, what is the big deal? And they made this public announcement that, that the, the great father of our nation, Eric Williams, had passed away. And I remember everybody in that auditorium was just like, what? How is it that he just died so mysteriously? And then some guys went out and said, you know, boy, that man ain't dead, you know. They're doing something. And some of us were waiting for the resurrection, if I could say, of Eric. It didn't happen. You know, people love Elvis Presley in the States. And there's always these rumors, boy, I saw Elvis at a gas station. I saw him pumping gas down by me too. But we, we, we always have these ideas that some people can just rise from the dead or it's some fiction that people who we love and admire died. But this is not fiction. Jesus actually rose from the dead. And to be honest with you, this is the distinguishing feature or quality about Jesus Christ. The authenticity of the Christian faith rests on one central fact, the resurrection of Jesus. No other religious personality can claim that fact. Moses, as great as he was, died, and his bones are somewhere in the desert. You think about even great spiritual leaders like Prophet Muhammad, who is the leader and origin of the Muslim faith. He died, and he, his bones are, are still buried. You think about some of the, the great people of influence, the, the, the popes or Mother Teresa. All these people have died, and they're dead. Only Jesus, only Jesus can claim to have died and have rose from the dead. <clears throat> and not only did he do this, but he is the only person to have been able to convince people that this is exactly what has happened. There are some people, I, I live in a Jewish area, and there are some, some, some Jews who, who claim that there's a particular rabbi who, who is the Messiah. And he died, and there are vigils, annual vigils, near this um, rabbi's grave in the hope that he will rise from the dead. If you're familiar with the, with the Rastafari faith, you know, I grew up in Jamaica, and, and you know, I kind of researched a lot about Ionai Selassie. You know, we, the Rastafarians, believe that Selassie 
was a descendant of David, and he was the Messiah. That's why they say, Hail Selassie. Now, if you didn't know that, it's okay. These are free things you learn at church. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that Selassie died, and his bones remain in the grave. The only person who can say that he died and rose from the grave is Jesus. And our entire faith is hinged upon this one central fact, the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus was not resurrected, we should all go home and watch cricket. Why we had to get dressed up and put on cologne and put on our dentures and everything. We, we, should, we should be home watching cricket. <laughs> Acts 17. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul went to a city called Athens. Now in those days, the Greeks, they, they, they worshipped a, a panoply of gods. Apollos, Zeus, Hermes. And Acts 17, Paul goes to this, this, this city of Athens. And in verse 22, he says, And Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. So Paul walks into this city, and they are very religious. They're, they worship different gods, some gods they don't even know. Now, I can relate to that, worshiping a, an unknown god, because I spent many years going to church. I don't understand what that man is saying. I don't understand what he's saying, what he's talking about. I asked some of my friends, do, do you understand what the priest is saying? They're like, no, I don't know, but we're going every Sunday. And we're taking religious class at St. Mary's to, to worship what? Someone who we don't even know. It made no sense. And that's why many of us, as we got older, we said, enough with this. Can I get an amen from, all right. So you know what I'm talking about. Paul goes to Athens and he doesn't go, oh, I see you're religious, so let me back out. Let me back out and I see you have, a, I see you have some spiritual bones in your body. Let me go on to the next city. No. He says, what you are worshiping and, and, and believing is not accurate. It's not accurate because now we have a knowledge of the Christ, the Messiah, who we know, who we've touched, and who can change your life. Now we live in a multicultural and multi, what, what, what's the word? Uh, Multi-ethnic community, country. It's just a beautiful thing. We've got people from African heritage, people from Indian heritage. We, we've got people who, are, who, have, uh, who believe in the Hindu God, who believe in the uh, Prophet Muhammad. And there's a whole bunch of different religions of all sorts of variations in Trinidad, right? Okay. Well, how do we handle that? How do we handle that? Do we, do we look at someone who's Hindu and go, well, you know, you're religious, and so let me back off. Do we do that? Do we look at someone who's a Muslim and say, well, you're really devoted to, to Prophet Muhammad, so let me back off because you seem religious. No. The question is, even to the Hindu or to the Buddhist or to the Muslim, they need an opportunity to hear about the risen Messiah. There is a reason why we believe in Jesus Christ, and it is because he rose from the dead. And this is our clear message to the world, whether you have religion or none. We proclaim a risen Messiah. Can I get an amen? amen. Number two, we proclaim the wounded lamb. You know what's interesting is in Revelation chapter 5, it says that I saw the right hand of him who sat on the scroll, on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open their scroll? 
but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of whom of him who sat on the throne. And in verse 8 he said, it says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to, to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Amen. The book of Revelation is the final revelation we've received from the Apostle John. And in that revelation, John says he was given an opportunity to sort of see into the future. And this is a very important passage. And I've, I've studied this passage and I've looked at it, and you know what really stands out to me? He says when he sees the lamb, it says, it says I saw the lamb looking as it had been slain. And I've often read that and go, okay, all right, great. But then I started to think, wow, you know, wounds are something that we as human beings want to hide, right? If you had a little cut or, or a scar, you want to do a little plastic surgery, put some, you know, when I was young, I, my mom used to tell me, put some cocoa butter on the scar because my skin would kind of keloid and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I don't like marks. None of us do. And so we like to put stuff over the wound. Right? Don't we? Yeah. Right? And here we see Jesus in his glorified state. And it says, John saw the lamb and he said, that, 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 that lamb was, was slain. That's, that's, not, that's, that's not a completely whole lamb with no wounds. That, you could see that there's wounds. And I've, 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 for, for years I've been pondering this. I'm like, why couldn't these wounds just go away? Why couldn't God, in his, in his infinite power and wisdom, who's the healer of all wounds, why couldn't he just patch up those wounds so the lamb would look fresh? You ever wonder that? The slain lamb is at the throne. And I wonder, you know, that in some way Christ must feel honored to have these wounds. And what, what do those wounds prove? Well, in Isaiah, it says, Isaiah 53 says, by those wounds we have been healed. So Christ is proud to carry those wounds because in those wounds are our healing. And, and the elders and the angels that surround the throne at this very hour are looking at that wounded lamb. And Christ is proud to bear those wounds because it is by those wounds we have been healed. And who injured him? We did. Our sin put those wounds on Jesus. And every time we go to God in prayer and we cry out to Jesus, you must remember the, the one to whom you are praying to, the wounded lamb. Don't ever forget that, church. 
people need to know that that is him who is on the throne, a wounded Messiah. You know, when you see pictures of Napoleon Bonaparte and Julius Caesar, you see Napoleon on this horse looking in triumph. And, ah, I am Napoleon. We see a Jesus wounded. And what does that have to say about us? How do we handle our wounds? How do we handle our wounds? Yeah, somebody in the church wounded you. Somebody in the church hurt you. You know why? Because you get a bunch of people who are sinners in one place, and what do you think is going to happen? They're going to sin. Yeah, your wife wounded you. Yes, your husband wounded you. And your kids wounded you. What do you do with those wounds? Do you walk around going, boy, how them fellas treated me this way, boy? Do we walk around with bitterness and anger? And we upset that this person did this to us 10, 15 years back? I ain't talking to this one. I ain't talking, and you're vexed with everybody. Is that the way you see your Messiah dealing with his wounds? I think there's a reason why Jesus is presented in the book of Revelations as a wounded Messiah. Because wounds are part of life. Wounds are part of our Christian struggle. And we must not just, we must understand that God is sovereign over everything. Whatever wound you receive, God allowed it to happen. And, and sometimes we've been wounded unjustly. We've been wounded unjustly and unfairly. But didn't that same thing happen to Jesus? And so maybe we're missing one of the most important truths that God wants to teach us. That unjust suffering is redemptive. That God wants to transform us and to help us to become more like Jesus when we receive wounds that we don't feel we deserve. This is who we proclaim. The wounded lamb. Point number three. We'll just skip a couple slides. That would, thank you. <clears throat> we proclaim Christ as judge of all mankind. Revelations 19. Again, we look at the final revelation that the apostle John gave us. And he says in Revelations 19, After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of, the, of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God. He who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him 
riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a picture of Christ returning to the earth to judge the earth. To judge the earth. Now I'm sure when you turn on your YouTubes and your TVs and your radios, what you're going to hear is that God is a God of grace. Right? The guy's a forgiving God. And you kind of get the impression that you, you, you could do whatever you want to do. And God is, God is a God of grace, right? And I agree. God is a God of grace. And praise God, have, have we all not received grace and mercy? Right? And praise God for his grace because he has treated us far better than any of us deserve. But I... I find it curious that the message of Christ as, as judge is, thank you, Ron, it's not even watered down, it's virtually silent. Why is that? It is, is the grace only Jesus what the first century proclaimed? No. They preached Christ as judge. They preached it publicly. In Acts chapter 2, G, uh, the apostle Peter said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For God, David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That statement right there is a public declaration of judgment. Jesus is going to sit at the right hand of the Father until anyone who is opposed to his teachings or to him personally will become a footstool for his feet. That is a public testimony of the fact that Christ will judge us. It was proclaimed publicly and it was proclaimed privately. In Acts chapter 24, the apostle Paul stood before Felix and his wife Drusilla and it says in verse 24, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Check this out. Verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Do you see that? What did Paul talk about? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, enough for now. See, what happens is we don't want to get people scared. But this is exactly what we see the Apostle Paul doing with a ruler, Felix, who could put him to death. And so, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is we've got to have a complete picture of the Christ who we are proclaiming. He is a risen king. He is a wounded lamb. And he is the final judge for all the earth. We cannot omit this truth from our testimony. We can't let the world tell us who the Messiah is. We must let the apostles and the teachings of the New Testament inform us about the Jesus whom we serve. Amen? Amen. My last point is to whom should the church proclaim Christ? Paul said, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Jesus' intention is that the gospel is proclaimed to every creature under heaven. 
Now, for the dog lovers and cat lovers out there, he's not talking about dogs and cats. He's talking about human beings. Can I get an amen? You know, God loves the animals, and he has a special place for their souls. But the people who Jesus came to save were men and women. And his desire is that every creature under heaven will hear the gospel. I think everyone needs to consider the people in your immediate sphere of influence. Okay, if, if we as a church are to proclaim Christ, and that is our sacred duty, and we call ourselves Christians, we have to consider the people in our immediate sphere of influence. We have to ask ourselves, has this person ever heard the gospel of Christ in its entirety? Listen to the question. There are people in our jobs, they go to church, like many of us did, but we, they, they may not have ever heard the gospel of Christ in its entirety. Your job, your neighbors, I appreciate the, the um, house churches. What a great opportunity. What a great opportunity to share the full message of Christ with our neighbors. You know, last, last week there were 580 people that came to church, filled the auditorium. People were standing at the back. Many of those people may have come to church, this church for the first time. And you know what struck me about coming to the church for the first time? People actually talk to each other. I'm like, you all talk to each other? When I went to church, as soon as the last thing, last handshake, I'm out the door. I'm like, wow, these guys seem to like each other. You know, people have never seen a fellowship like this. Many people. We got to realize it's an opportunity to proclaim Christ to them. Ask yourself in your immediate sphere of influence. I am so proud. Uh, I was having a conversation yesterday with Roger Blash, and Roger Blash was talking to me. I just asked him, how's your brother doing spiritually? And he was telling me that his brother Albert was, was, was um, talking to him about the fact that he was going to Price Mart, and he wanted to talk to people about Jesus, and he wanted to get invitations to invite people to church. When Ro I'm telling you, when Roger was sharing that with me, I felt goosebumps. Why? Because this young disciple gets it. That didn't, that didn't come from man. That, that Albert's mind has been pierced by the light of the gospel. And he's realizing, I got to do something. Because we can all do something to proclaim Jesus as Christ. Amen? Last Sunday, we had dinner with the Powells, the Lafleurs, and the Barnes. And we were talking, the food was really great. And Merlene and Robin started talking to the waitress. We ended up having a talk with the waitress about, about Jesus, about coming to church. The waitress brought the manager, and we invited him to church. Then there was another young man who um, was helping us, who was making us laugh. I invited him to church. What, what were we doing? Yeah, we were having dinner and trying to connect and fellowship. But there was an opportunity right around us. I appreciate the campus brothers and sisters who are trying their best to get out there and make something happen on the campuses. I remember me as a student. I was lost and didn't know my way, my left hand from my right hand, until some student who didn't know me from a can of paint got off a, saw me walking off a bus and came up to me and said, would you like to learn more about the Bible? There is something we as individuals can do. Amen? I think we need to consider the nations within our reach. God has blessed the Caribbean. We have 13 churches in different islands throughout the Caribbean, and I'm proud of all of them. But I want to bring to your attention the fact that we have 1.8 million souls in different nations and islands in the Caribbean for which there is no international churches of Christ. And why is that a problem? Because, look, I'm not sure what other people are teaching. I know what some are teaching, but I don't know what other people are teaching. But I, in my 30 years of being a Christian, I have sat down with people from many different denominations who have never, ever heard, never heard, that Jesus wants them to be a disciple. Never heard that. These people have been going to church for years. They have never been, the, 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 the truth about sin has never been clearly explained to them as it was explained to you and I. And so my concern is for the 1.8 million souls 
who are languishing right now on these islands. We have five French-speaking nations with 1.07 million people, seven English-speaking nations with 467,000 people, and five Dutch-speaking nations with 322,000 souls in these nations. These are nations within our geographic realm. And I'm telling you that some way, somehow, the men and women in this church have got to take responsibility for these souls. And it's okay. You don't need to clap. Because I remember when Jesus had thousands of people and, and, he, and they were looking for bread. And the disciples were like, we're going to get bread to feed all, 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 all these, these people. They didn't know. They didn't, they didn't know how it was going to get done. And sometimes that's what we get caught up with. How is it going to get done? I don't care about the how. I care about the why. I care about the why. Jesus said, what do you have? Well, we have is five loaves and two fish. There's always more bread than fish. He said, he said, he said, he said, give it to me. And they went out and they passed out bread and fish and every man jack and women and children were fed. And to this day, you, yes, let's dial up the apostles and ask them how it happened. They would tell you, I don't know. I, re I don't know. Read it for yourself. Uh, how it happened. How you could be passing bread and fish in a basket and it just multiplied. How it happened? I don't know. Look, one of you may get a job. I know I'm going behind apart from my time, but I think this is important. One of you may get a job opportunity to go to one of these islands. One of you may have a coworker who's from Martinique or Guadeloupe who is in your sphere of influence and who you may influence to become a Christian and then they go back to their hometown. Some of you may go on vacation and say, hey, you know, let's, let's go to Antigua. But you're going to Antigua, yeah, you're going to go on Lyme on the beach and everything, but you're going because you know that you have the spirit of Christ living in you and there needs to be a church in this place. I don't know how. I know why. And I know who. I can, I'll email this slide to you so you could be praying about this. But we cannot ignore the needs of these men and women who are sitting in darkness. I want to close with this passage in Acts chapter 1. Christ's vision for his church. He, right before he ascended to heaven, he, he met with his apostles. And he said this. He said in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you read through the, God, if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that the, this, this was exactly the plan that the apostles followed. They preached in Jerusalem, then they went to Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I'll say it was the ends of the, the known earth. Because subsequent to that time, many worlds were discovered. And I'm here to tell you that we have not yet reached the ends of the earth. And we've got to be able to look with, with joy and gladness over the past 30 years, and, and look at what God has done in our lives. It's so encouraging. It's so inspiring. My heart has been so encouraged and inspired by your faith and your perseverance. 
There are those who have been wounded but have been healed. There have been times when we needed to be encouraged and lift each other up. Many things have happened in our lives. Some, some, are, some, some face death, illness, grief in different forms, different capacities. But I believe that the time is now to look to the future, to look to what the next 5, 10, 30 years of the Port of Spain Church of Christ will look like. I believe the Spirit, through all the different leadership transitions, God has been in control of this church, amen? The Spirit has handed the torch of leadership to Nino and Merlin, and we gotta support them as they try to carry the gospel to Trinidad, Tobago, and to the different towns and villages. The personnel might change. The people might change. But the mission remains the same. Christ's vision for you and for me is that we will take this treasure of the gospel that we have in our hearts and we will share this treasure to men and women in, the town, in our neighborhoods, in the cities in Trinidad and Tobago, to the end of the earth. Let us, brothers and sisters, keep proclaiming the risen Christ, the wounded lamb, and Christ as the judge of all mankind. To him be glory and honor and praise in his church. God bless you.